This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Since leaving the Navy, our guest tonight has trained more than 20 SWAT teams around the United States and instructed numerous special response teams for the Department of Homeland Security. He has deep experience and highly specialized training in classified global counterterrorism operations, all with one goal in mind, to find and rescue kidnapped women and children who have been dragged into the nightmare of sex trafficking. David Lopez joins us again this week because it's the end of the sixth day. The sun is set and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Over the last several years, our guest tonight, David Lopez, has served as a lead tactics instructor and conducted several traffic, uh, child trafficking rescue missions around the world. And if you didn't meet him last weekend on Shabbat Night Live, you will tonight. Everyone here at Shabbat Night Live loves David, what he does. I mean, it's hard not to jump on the bandwagon to help this guy, and, and we're not alone. Tony Robbins, the most famous motivational speaker in the world, is very passionate about this cause, as are many of America's most famous business leaders, uh, Tony's friends, uh, entertainers and sports figures. And you're going to find out what it's all about tonight on the second episode of Operation Innocence in just a few minutes. Uh, speaking of time, the weather is beginning to change, students are back in school, and we are on the first Shabbat of a new month on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. We are on the first Shabbat of the month of Elul, that is the sixth biblical month, and it was on this week in history that Yeshua sent out the 12 disciples in pairs and told them not to take anything with them. You remember that story? And this is where we read the famous phrase, I am sending you forth as sheep among wolves. That's in Matthew 10, 16. That happened this week. And uh, you can read it all about it in the larger print edition of the Chronological Gospels Bible. Very easy on the eyes. You can get it at arudawakening.tv slash large. And before we get to tonight's teaching, I want to bring on someone who has a very special gift for you this month. Uh, it's the first time we have been able to talk about it since it's a new month. And it's perfect for the fall feasts of the Lord, which are coming up at the end of this month. So please welcome the Chief Operating Officer of Aruduakin International, Ted Clayton. Hi, Scott. Welcome, Ted. How are you? Well, thank you for letting me be here to talk about such a wonderful love gift this month. Yes, and it's all about Israel. I love the fact you've worn Israel colors today. That's with right. Tie there everything. It's great. That's uh, it. It's almost like it was planned. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the, the, the greater gift is, is with the, uh, the Israel book here. But let's start where we start. Uh, and again, we're doing a three-tiered love gift. Yes. This is something we've continued. Uh, you've encouraged us to do it because it works really well and folks get uh, a lot of great stuff. Well, I, I tell you folks, this month, the love gift is absolutely breathtaking. You are not gonna wanna miss out on this special gift coming to you for those people who give $300 or more. But for anyone who gives $50 or more, what do they get, Scott? Well, they get possibly the best part of this, which is Michael's special teaching. Absolutely. This is what everybody jumps on the bandwagon for uh, the love gift for. And this is Michael's uh, series on Acts. He's continuing it on through, and it's called Burning Questions. Yes. And what this is all about, I'm just going to read the back a little bit. It says, in a world of radically conflicting social doctrines and increasing hostility toward biblical truth, don't we know that? Yes, indeed. Uh, how do we patiently endure in a world gone mad? So this is, you know, the burning questions that even the disciples were having that, you know, we have all of these different factions, how do we get the truth through to these people uh, when there's so many different types of people and, and religions going on? And absolutely, and remember folks, this is not on YouTube, this is not on television, right. this is only when you give uh, a love gift donation of $50 or more. And if you give $100 or more, well, this is where we start getting into the fall feast. Indeed. So you'll, you'll get the, the teaching and, yes, a ram's horn shofar. This thing is beautiful. It's uh, They measure it along the curve. And when yes. measured along the curve, this is what they call a 12-inch um, shofar. Right. And this is a ram's horn. This is not the, the kudu. This is the ram's horn. Right. And this is, this is so special because this is the particular horn that most people use 
use because rams are more prevalent than the larger horns. So this is just special. And for $100 or more, you can't beat this when you give your love gift. Right, in biblical times too, this is the true horn. Because oh, absolutely. they use the ram saying. horn, right. yeah. Exactly. And the, the bigger, the longer ones, call the, uh, they call them the Yemenite shofars. Yes. Those are from an African kudu. So those right. are not as you know prevalent in, in biblical uh, literature, but this is the Indeed. true ram's horn. So you, it's nice and polished and everything. So that's for a gift of $100 or more. And for $300, oh, if I may. Oh, please. This is yes. my one of my favorite love gifts of all time because I really study a lot of history. And folks, you are going to absolutely love this with your love gift of $300 or more. And I'd like to come over here to this camera for just a moment just to be able to show you all of the great coins of, of the time. This is a walk through history uh, in coinage. There's a lot of people out there that uh, study coins. I know I've heard people with coin collections and so forth. You're not going to want to miss this because this is so absolutely special. It was the coins of the time of the Bible and it is just magnificent. The great thing about this particular item is not only can you look at the coin, but you can actually remove the plastic here just very simply and you you can actually hold the coin in your hand. It's just absolutely breathtaking. And it gives you a historical uh, reference to the coin. It's just absolutely amazing. Folks, you are not going to want to miss this particular love gift this month. Possibly, in my opinion, one of the greatest love gifts that we have ever given, Scott. I think so too, and it's we just uh, discovered that by accident. Obviously, the manufacturer meant to have that sliding window, but oh, we yes. just discovered that by accident, where you can li literally slide the window to the and side, you can, and you can touch and each yeah, individual you can pull the coin one. right out. So here you go. You you there just you take this out, and then you pull the coin out, and you can actually that. touch the coin. That is really neat. That I is like just that. incredible. What else, though, Scott? Well, we get a, a book of uh, the of a book of Israel. Uh, some of the most famous sites in Israel, all kinds of wonderful information. And uh, we're going to have more information on that in just a second. But I want to thank you for joining us today, Ted. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, coming up, a man uh, who with highly specialized training in classified global counterterrorism operations. One goal in mind he has, to find and rescue kidnapped women and children who have been dragged into the nightmare of sex trafficking. David Lopez joined us again this week for the second of four episodes of Operation Innocence. David uh, does this work personally, and the world knows about it tonight because of you. You have done something special personally. You have supported Shabbat Night Live to make it happen. So thank you. We depend on you week after week to keep this information coming. You are the only sponsor of the show, and we want to thank you for doing so with our new love gift, as, as uh, Ted and I were just talking about. Here's more details on all the stuff you can get for the month of September only. Take a look. As the world preaches acceptance and tolerance, there is an equal and opposite hostility toward biblical truth. In a world of radically conflicting doctrines, how can we stay the course as we work out our own salvation? Michael Rood presents Burning Questions, a special teaching about inward examination and personal responsibility. We know that our reward for eternity depends on what we do now in this one life that we have. Salvation is of grace. Reward is of merit. So let's not sleep. Burning Questions is available for one month only. It's not on YouTube and it's not for sale. It's a gift from Michael Rood to thank you for your love gift donation of just $50. Or as a special offer for the upcoming fall feasts, donate $100 or more to receive this teaching plus a beautifully polished ram's horn shofar. And for a gift of $300 or more, you'll receive even more. You'll get burning questions, the ram's horn shofar, plus a book of Israel archeology span and a book of biblical coin replicas. Learn the stories you've never heard about Israel's most famous archeological sites from biblical times. And the book of coin replicas shares the history of currency in Israel, including actual size replicas you can hold in your hand. These special gifts are perfect for introducing your family to the upcoming Fall Feasts of the Lord. You'll get Michael Rood's exclusive love gift teaching, Burning Questions, for your love gift donation of $50 the teaching and the ram's horn shofar for a love gift of $100 or more. Or get everything plus the archeology span and coin replica books 
for a love gift donation of $300 or more. Make your love gift donation now to receive these special gifts. Call now or visit monthlylovegift.com. The last night that Yeshua was with his disciples, the last supper before the Passover was sacrificed, he took bread and he took wine. He said before that Abraham saw his day and rejoiced, but what does that mean? He saw his day and rejoiced. Well, it was the Melech Zadik, the king of righteousness that brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. He blessed the Most High with the blessing that Abraham taught Yitzhak, Yitzhak taught Yaakov, and is still spoken today. Whenever bread and wine is served at a Jewish table, whenever it is Sabbath, especially around the world, the bread and the wine are brought forth with this blessing. Baruch atah Yehovah, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, borei pari hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua then said, blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood that pays the sin penalty because of the broken covenant. As often as we do this, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. So break the bread, share the wine, and we do this in remembrance of him until he comes. Last week on Shabbat Night Live, I introduced David Lopez who is a former Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 8, and now is engaged in delivering women and children from the sex trafficking that is going on in America and especially in Haiti and engaging with groups around the world to deliver people from the oppressors. To deliver the oppressed is really the byline of what David does. And David's story starts out as a preacher's kid. And David, uh, from a preacher's kid, you finally end up in England, as we, we touched on last week, under the ministry of Derek Prince, one of my personal heroes. And Great man. probably the only preacher that I really listened to. I mean, I listened to him hour by hour. You got to actually be with a man to be in England. And it was a life-changing experience. You're awakening for Israel in his ministry. Yeah, I devoured uh, Derek Prince's teachings, his books. All I was doing was reading. And, and at one time, one of my jobs that I had was putting the labels on the, the uh, you know, the little tapes and the video cassettes that were going out. Oh, I took all these goodness. little jobs in his, so all the things going out in the world, I was putting labels. And as I was doing these little tedious tasks on my side time, all that would be playing is his teachings over and over and over again. So it was a phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity to just soak in some amazing biblical teaching. Well, that, that's, that's a way to brainwash yourself. You <laughs> know, right. uh, as the scripture <laughs> says, renewing your mind, right, right. Uh, that, that's what it takes. We really have to yep. wash our brain uh, from, from the religion and the right. filth that we collected. Well, the, uh, you know, this, this really led you onto the mission field down in Guatemala, which uh, right. I, I know sir, as you walked around our office, uh, you greeted so many people just speaking Spanish to them because we have such a large Spanish contingency. Well, so this is where you ended up in your ministry. Yeah, um, I was. I wanted to 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 get involved. I wanted to you know get engaged with the world, and I went down and worked with a number of churches, and um, you get to see a lot of the good things, but a lot of the very um, you know negative things that happen on the mission field, which is a lot of showiness, a lot of you know people wanting to get accolades and get people to raise support for things that very little support goes to a lot of those things that happen. Mm -hmm. And I just saw team after team come down and this was actually a really, really tough time for me because that, I, I really thought that's where I was gonna find it. You know, I was working in the mountains with 
uh, right. the, 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 Mayans, real, the real poor, the real Mayan needy. Mayan people, true, true ancient Mayan people that were receiving eye and ear clinics from the Peace Corps, and these were people that had need. And everything that, you know, the majority of what I saw was people wanting to, um, you know, have a story to tell back home, look how well we did, but there wasn't a lot actually happening on the ground for the people. And the people kind of saw that and they, they played the game a little bit religiously. They, they, made, they acted like they were having, getting converted to things because they knew that's what Americans liked and they knew that would get more money. Um, yeah. So it's just a, a, it's something I saw that was, for me, in such a moment in my life where I was looking so hard for something real and I thought, if you're going to find it, it's going to be in some third world country somewhere, right? You're going to find real, real living. Mm -hmm. And I just saw this horrible game that uh, really just put me in a very negative place for a number of years. A lot of people forget about, you know, what they called them in India, rice Christians. Yeah. Where, wherever the food came from, that's what they, that's, you know, right. that's what they embraced for the moment in time. But as far as really teaching them, uh, changing their heart, just didn't happen. No, it wasn't, it wasn't really about that. It was about this, you know, the constant need to get more dollars to come down. And I get that, that's for, you know, everyone needs, you know, finances to make things work. But the way people do it, and the way that they're selling, you know, oh, look at this poor child, and that's the newsletter back home, but are they really helping the child? <laughs> so that whole kind of game became just a very frustrating thing to see. And um, it made me just, it, it also made me ask more questions about my faith and say, what is really, why are so many people embracing this system, this model of, of, of pretentious, you know, help, you know, that's being given out? So it really, that, it, uh, that was the onset of from wanting to work and really working with one of the premier teaching ministries of the world. Now the disillusionment sets in to where in, in the real world, what's going on, how did that affect you? What, what, what turned in your heart? Where did you go from there? Well, um, this was right around the time where um, two things were happening. I was, I was turning away from what I saw and the next thing I saw on the horizon was the Navy, right? So. The Navy is where, I mean, I, I was, uh, years ago I thought about becoming a Navy SEAL and I, this is where I, I made this decision right around in this time, I'm gonna become a Navy SEAL. I was out of shape, I was a little bit fat, I smoked and um, I had to completely change my entire life for one year and become, you know, Iron Man, you know, within right, within one right. year to be able to, to compete. Well, that, to go that, after that really is incredible. I mean, going from you know the athletic background of perhaps a professional football player uh, to <laughs> being overweight, giving up basically, yeah. giving up on life, very and, depressed, and then uh, and, and then deciding to turn it around and become a seal after all that. That's right. I, I chose to. You're not a young man at this point. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm around, when I joined the Navy, I was around 24 years old. Oh so. my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the recovery just isn't as fast at 24 years no. old as was at 17, 18. Now, most of the guys were, were the young bucks, were the 18 year olds, and there was a few guys even older than me, you know, they had, they had a hard time as well. But I mean, yeah. it was a tough decision, and, uh, but I was, uh, one thing, I was a little bit disillusioned with my religion, but I knew I needed to do this. With the SEAL teams, I knew it was something I needed to do. So I had this sense of direction, but from a personal religious standpoint, I was pretty disillusioned. Okay, so tell us, you know, the Navy, going into the SEALs, what's it like? A lot of people don't have any idea what the SEAL training is, what yeah. BUDS is, uh, so give us some background on that. Uh, take, us, take us into the surf in the sand, if you <laughs> yeah. please. Well, BUDS is uh, a very, BUDS is basic underwater de demolition SEAL training. We okay, call it so BUDS. first of all, you enlisted in the, the Navy. That's right. Uh, Went to boot that's camp. A, a four year enlistment. That's right. Okay, at that point. With and a so two year extension that was required if I go to SEAL training. So they send me, if I meet the criteria, they promise me to send me st directly to SEAL training. And that's really where your life uh, um, you know, changes because you get thrown into this uh, environment where all these men, 300 men, classed up with our initial group uh, to go through this course. And we ended up graduating, I think, somewhere around 35 guys, so. Well, okay, now I have to, to tell people that these 300 men, 
that, like you, spent a year in conditioning and yeah. most of their life, you know, these are the Eagle Scouts. These are the guys that yeah. all their life, they, they wanted to be a warrior. They were raised with a gun in their hand. That's, that's it's right. Like, you know, I remember, From you know, middle sixth, Alabama. Sixth, sixth grade, <laughs> went to a one-room schoolhouse, John Heppy, Ivan Wood and I, yeah. we got to take our rifles to school. You know, we, we were always shooting, always hunting, so we were trained to be warriors. And this is, this is the category, the class of people that their whole life were disciplined that wanted to do this perhaps a professional football player. but yeah. And so out of the 300 that went in, absolutely gung-ho, we are gonna change the world, we're gonna fight for righteousness, and, and how many graduate from that first yeah. weeding out? Yeah, about 35, and a lot of that, a lot of that happens in a, in a week that's typically around the fourth or fifth week, it's called Hell Week. Hell Week is designed to be the place where you just level the students and you make them wish they had never come there. You don't sleep for five days. You, uh, you don't, you, even if you wanna use the restroom, you go just standing where you are, okay? You don't go indoors, you are beaten, you are, you know, there's, you're wet and sandy the entire time yeah, at and, night, and, you're and in beaten. the ocean. This is not a figure of speech. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it, 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 is, it is physically to break you. If yeah. you can be broken, they are going to do it. That's their job, to break you because they don't want Oh, oh, they don't want innocent bystanders in there. They want only the people that, that want to do this or die. Everywhere you run during Hell Week, you have a boat on your head. This is why everyone's bald after Hell Week because that boat's just bouncing in your head. Hurt. A lot of guys come out with neck injuries. And the other thing we have is logs. We carry these logs around, these big logs. And I still have the scars on my hands from picking up those logs with all the sand every single time rubbing those same areas. So this is, it's the little things, you know, I, I think the things that people don't see when they look into Hell Week, the things that really bothered guys, the first day of Hell Week, they have you low crawl through the sand for hours and you're like, what's going on here? This is so easy. What they're doing is getting that sand into every single crevice that you have and they're about to run you up and down and they're creating these massive, massive chafing well, spots yeah. day one Everything is very, very scientifically, you know, they, they have a structure for, you know, mm -hmm. there's a method mm -hmm. to their madness and it's all the little things that they get you with and so they're just testing you. It was tough for me because I contracted pneumonia about three days before Hell Week. So I was before dealing- Before Hell Week? <laughs> yes, okay, so yes. you've been in training uh, for, for a while, now you contract pneumonia. Well, what's yeah. that like? Uh, it was very tough. When I first, when I first realized that's what I had, I, I, was sh I showed up one day, this was a few days before Hell Week, and I showed up for a Monday morning run, which starts at 3 a.m. Now, medical opens at six. So in order to get to medical, I had to do my early morning 3 a.m. run, which I already knew I had pneumonia, hardest run of my life. I finished with one second to spare. Had I not made it, I wouldn't have been in the program. So it was a do or die run that I mm -hmm. needed to do. So then I, I finally realized I have pneumonia and they say, well, we're gonna let you start, but every single medical check, because every day in Hell Week, you have three medical checks that you go through and they make sure that we're taken care of because they're, they're really pushing us hard. And every time, the mental thing for me is I thought every single time they were gonna pull me out. The doc kept saying, Dave, I can't let you go any further. There's too much fluid in your lungs. Every time he listened, I begged him, let me go another three or four hours. And so it was a real, it really had me mentally thinking I was gonna be done anyway, you know? So it was a challenge. So not to give up when you had a medical condition of that severity, where yeah. they're, they're almost pulling you out uh, by the hour. That's right. And, and guys, and, and every guy has his story for Hell mm -hmm. Week. My story was that I, I know guys that went through with stress fractures, guys that went through with fractures in their neck that made it all the way through. There's guys that went through a whole lot, you know, um, and there's really good guys that were injured beyond repair if, yep. to be able to continue training that right. were legitimately, you know, injured that, that really could have been just as good of a seal as me or anyone else. And, and what people don't understand that, that when that happens, these men pay for it at the end of their lives. When they're 50, they're oh, 60, yes. they're 70 years That's old. Right. You don't pay for it when you're young. You can heal up from that. That's right. But you pay for it at the, the, at the far end of that. That is a, a lifetime, a lifetime that, that goes into that, into the service of the country to be your absolute best. And that's why the SEALs have my absolute utmost respect uh, as fires of warriors because getting a, a, just a glimpse of what you, you went through and, and that's just the beginning. 
No, and, and this I, is just hell week. This is just yeah. There's there's a, another nine more months after that, nine to ten more months of training to, to be done. <laughs> so before you become a seal after hell week. So, but it is one of those moments where they really whittle us down. But I must say also, I have tons of respect for the Marine Corps and serve with a lot of amazing Marines. So we have tons of mutual respect and synergy with the SEAL teams in the Marine Corps. Amen. Amen. No semper fi. <laughs> Always, always faithful. Now, um, uh, so uh, let, let's go. Okay, uh, Hell Week, and now we're uh, we're we're after. Um, so uh, tell tell us about the the, the graduation, uh, the, the the duration <laughs> of time. This this nine month thing. Uh, this this thing's so, incredible. Yeah, Boot camp is only three months. This is nine months so of absolute. Hell. There's a period where, you know, they have one more difficult wicket, which is called pool comp, and I struggle with this one. It's when they throw you underwater, they put these twin 80 tanks on your back, and they let instructors just maul you down there. And they rip everything, all your regulator comes out, everything's flying around everywhere, and your job is to maintain composure, hold your breath, wait for them to stop beating you up, and then put all of your gear back on while you're holding your breath in a meticulous fashion. You have to do everything in the right sequence or else you fail. The moment mm, that regulator mm, gets mm, back mm. into your mouth, they hit you again and someone else. So it's a wild time underwater. And if you're breathing compressed air in a pool, if you shoot to the surface, you can get an arterial gas embolism. So it's a very, very dangerous drill. Um, it's a very psychological drill. And this is probably the last real wicket if you make it through pool competency, you're gonna be a SEAL. That's what everyone knows. After that, we do all the fun stuff. We learn how to shoot, we learn to be snipers, we learn to, how to jump out of planes, we learn how, you know, all the diving. We do all the cool, you know, fun stuff after we've proven that we can actually make it mentally. That's mm -hmm. what it's really all about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that is incredible. So now, now you're actually uh, attached to the a SEAL team That's right. at this. So uh, SEAL team eight, is, That's right. is it, okay? And, uh, and so now, t tell us about this, because uh, now bonding as a SEAL team, these are the guys that you're gonna go into combat with. Uh, you're not all going to live through this, uh, uh, through your experiences, and so there's a real bonding, a real camaraderie, not only that, uh, but a, a love, a brotherhood to where you're going to willingly put your life in the line of fire. You're, you know, you're going to end up jumping on the grenade to save the other guys. That's and you know that. Right. Yep, that's right. So, how does this affect? What, what's your lifestyle? What is it like uh, as a as a member of SEAL Team Eight? You know, it's it's fraternity like. Um, the bond that we have, we travel together all around the country, all around the world. We do training trips, and you know, there's a lot of fun to be had. The guys like to, you know, go out and be crazy, and um, so that environment was very much what it was. There were some times where people wanted to have, you know, group meetings, team meetings, and strip clubs, and that was, you know, this is just the normal way, you know, and, and, and uh, it's not well, always like that for every team or every single platoon, but there's this definitely. Uh, a pretty, you know, we're, we're living life thinking, you know, the next deployment, you know, this this could be a, you know, this could be the end in some way. So you had mm -hmm. this, you kind of have this, let's live now while we can feeling, and also it's tied to our brotherhood as well. We're all together. It's kind of our form of bonding too. All right. Now this is kind of hard to maintain the the Derek Prince. <laughs> You know that 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 that, that, that spiritual Derek, Derek would not have excellence. Approved. Uh, you know, so what, what's going on with you spiritually at this point? Derek would not have approved for these couple years. Um, the first two years, I was very depressed, partially because I'm seeing you know the politics of war, the way things are being fought. It's not quite what you think when you set off going in. That was a big part of it, but the other part of it was my own spiritual journey, which had, you know, I was very, very distraught at the things I had seen. I didn't really know what I believed. And I had that moment of Derek showing me all, all these amazing things about Israel, but still something was, something big was missing, right? And um, so it was actually um, in Baghdad, this is, this is crazy, but in Baghdad, when we were on, a, it, was, it was about my second year in, in the SEAL teams, and I stumbled upon one of your videos. In Baghdad. In Baghdad. Okay. We're chasing down terrorists every night. And in between that, when we had some downtime, the only things to do were play poker or play a video game, Call of Duty, or um, you know, look up you know, different, different videos. And what I was still trying to figure out, and Derek Prince is the one that planted the seed, 
I was like, what is, what is this about Israel? What, how, what does all this mean? And so I was Googling different things and I found a teaching. I believe one of the first teachings I saw from you was about, um, it was the one about um, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Oh yeah, the, that was one of the, the first, great secret of Solomon's temple. That's right, the great, that was one, like you were going into some serious history and at first I was like, what's this guy? He's dressed up and doing all these, what's he doing? Like, I, I was like, what is this? But I just listened to you and I said, oh my goodness, this man is piecing some things together. It's, it was really the changing point in my life. It was in Baghdad when I started to really devour your teachings. And it, wow. was, it was one after another, and I was like, light bulbs were going off all over the place, and all these things, I kept reading the Old Testament, I kept reading the Tanakh going, why doesn't this line up with this, and why, do I, why am I taught this? So you were just blasting those out of the water, as you like to do in your typical you know, fashion, in a very you know, flagrant way. And I was like, well, look at this guy. I can't believe somebody is actually you know, bold enough, because in my mind, I, I felt like this was my own secret journey at this point. I felt like there was no one else out there. I think that a lot of people feel this way. I felt like no one else is thinking like I'm thinking in the Old Testament, trying to make it more, you know, trying to make it fit more into the new. And here you are with this whole, you know, blueprint for how it all fits together. And for me, that was, that was uh, the beginning of my spiritual healing. Well, David, uh, we have to take a break before the flagrancy continues here on Shabbat <laughs> Night Live. Uh, but we're gonna be back right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, see, this is why we are doing what we do. This is why we put, after broadcast, we put all of our stuff free of charge on the internet. We put these things out at great expense to us, free to the world, because one man in Baghdad looking for truth, disillusioned with the Christian world that he was raised with, seeing the, 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 the the, the fraud that is going on in the name of the God of heaven, and yet we're able to reach him. We're able to reach our servicemen around the world because that is what we do. That's what Yeshua said to do. And we can only do it because you out there contribute to this ministry. A lot of you have, been, have grown up giving your 10% at, uh, in the offering plate. We don't have an offering plate to pass by and make you feel guilty. There, there's nothing there. You can only contribute to this ministry by going out of your way, by pressing the button, making a phone call. You're the ones that can make a difference to people around the world. People like Dave, like the SEAL Team 8. You can make a difference, but you have to take the action. Nobody's gonna do it for you. You've gotta do it, and now you've got two minutes and that's all you're gonna get. If you don't do it in these two minutes, this may be the last time that you get to see anything from a rude awakening. We don't know. We're just putting it out there as long and as hard and as fast and as broad as we possibly can. We're doing what Yeshua asked us to do. Now, will you do what he asked you to do? Freely you have received, now you can freely give. We'll see you in two minutes. Because of the faithful financial support of our partners, of our ambassador club members, we're able to get the gospel of the kingdom out to the entire world. Our message is going out around the world, and in Baghdad, that is where we met David Lopez, member of SEAL Team 8 as he is in Baghdad, and the questions that he had his entire life, growing up as a preacher's kid, now are getting answered. And I say to people, the video that he saw, The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple, is the most important video that I will ever do. I will never be as young, I will never talk as fast, or say anything thing as important as what I do in that two and a half hour video uh, concerning the hiding of the Ark of the Covenant and the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant and the confirmation of the covenant spoken by the prophet Daniel, Amos, and James in the book of Acts that will transpire in the last days. And so now things are all coming together and David has already been uh, uh, apprised of these things by Derek Prince in Israel's part in end time prophecy. Now it's all coming together for you. And I, I'm so proud to be a part of that, of that awakening, oh. that I 
can continue on with what Derek Prince has set in the hearts of people around the world. Well, I'm honored to be here, and I never even thought when I first started seeing these videos that I would ever you know, be sitting here beside you. And it's a complete honor because it was Derek Prince and you that had a massive, massive transformation on my life, on my thought process, helped me to connect dots that I was already, it was, I was already on the track. So I knew something was wrong, but everyone in their life at times needs somebody to help them connect those dots when they need it. And that's really what it was at a very, very crucial time. And I'll be frank, I was, I was at a very dark time when I found this, so. Can you tell us about that dark time? Because the, the, the politics, the politics of war is really what began wearing on you. And the rules of engagement, which, uh, right. you know, everything, everyone from, uh, you know, the, uh, what happened in Vietnam to what's happening in Afghanistan today, it's, it's the political rules of engagement that, that tear the heart of the warrior out, that, that cause the innocent to be destroyed and, and killed on the battlefield because of what politicians do. Tell us about that, I want you to be honest. Let me be honest about that. It is, this is the number one issue that plagues the special operations community and the military at large. It's the feeling of not having a true mission in what they're doing, as well as they're being scrutinized for the war effort that they're making by people that have never seen war. That is the hardest thing from a morale standpoint. People always talk about PTSD and the problems that are happening with veterans. Let's start with, let's stop putting veterans under this intense microscope by people who have no idea what they're discussing or what they're talking about. Um, rules of engagement have become so crippling for many of our guys that we can't even be effective in certain regions. There's places where our enemies know our rules of engagement and they will knowingly use them against us. They will fire at us, drop their weapon, they become a non-combatant the moment they drop their weapon and then okay, they run so, back to so a fallback they're, position. They're firing at you. They're, they're, they're killing, wounding. They're, and, and now they, they see, okay, now they drop their weapon. Knowing and, we can't fire. Because they're non-combatant now. Right, they're not an active threat. Or well, they're still, a, they're technically could be a combatant, but they're not an active threat to us and we're technically not supposed to engage there. One example, okay. one small example of and they run back to a fallback position where a weapon is already placed, okay, and all this right. is built into their tactics. <laughs> right, okay, that's the tactic, they know the rules. Right. So if a United States senator was out there, and they were firing at him, and they dropped their weapon, then, then you, you think that the rules of engagement would be the same if the senator I and the senator's son is out there, if the fortunate sons were out there. I think the senator would be the first one yelling, shoot that guy in the back. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Get them, because the, the hard thing with, with warfare is it's not an easy thing to see, and the problem in our day is everyone is seeing war. It, can you imagine in World War II, the beaches of Normandy, if we had had cameras actually seeing what was happening in real time and being reporting that back to the U.S. in real time like war is being reported today? Yeah. We would have pulled out within a few hours of that engagement, you know? Civilians yeah. were not meant to see war. And, right. and so now they are, and there's this problem with how do we do this, what's the moral way, and there's people that have no idea what they're talking about. And the disillusionment comes from issues like these. When I was still in, there were three guys in the SEAL teams that were accused of giving a terrorist, a known terrorist, a bloody lip. And this is a terrorist that hung four Blackwater contractors in Baghdad that ended up getting caught. And somewhere along the way, this guy got punched in the mouth by one of the Iraqis and he got blamed on three different seals. And they almost went to Leavenworth. This is how serious this is. I mean, they didn't even do it, number one. They didn't put a bolt in his head. No, uh, and let's be honest. Somebody else gave him a bloody lip and they blamed, he, he blamed this, it on them because he knew he could get away with it. That's exactly right. Um, this is also going on right now with a, a guy named Eddie Gallagher. Um, okay, tell teams. us about Gallagher. He's an amazing guy. He's being accused of uh, com completely fraudulently, uh, what they're saying is they called in an airstrike and that there was a guy who survived the airstrike and instead of offering medical aid, he executed him. That's what they're saying. Well, too bad his, his helmet cam tells a whole different story and there's a whole process of scrutinizing him. He's been arrested, 
He's been held without trial for a long period of time. He was finally actually recently released after months. He was arrested while he was in, I believe, Portsmouth Naval Hospital, being treated for a head wound. After, after NCIS knew that he was already arrested, they then sent a tactical unit to his house to, to bring in his kids with a tactical entry team to get his kids. Okay, I mean, so these uh, this is basically a SWAT team. They got the yes. flag jackets on, yes. uh, full automatic weapons, and they go in to arrest his teenage children while he's in the hospital. That's right. And um, it's, I mean. Where, where's his wife at this point? Uh, his wife, I believe, was at work. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe his wife was at work. She wasn't yeah. in the house. I don't believe when that well, happened. I could, I could right. be wrong about that. And, but and the, with their intelligence, you'd expect them to know exactly where she was when well, they, they made the yeah. raid on his house to arrest his children and drag them they out. They definitely knew he wasn't there because they already had him. Right, right. But they still sent the tactical unit in. I mean, that's a, that's a telling. Yeah, uh, uh, well, I hear yeah. there is uh, 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 some talk about. Uh, Trump pardoning pardoning him because you know he 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 is aware of what is going on the subversion that's happening. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, we're hoping that. That's I know um, Andrea and, and and Eddie. That's what they're they're praying and hoping for. And his family, his kids. I mean, the whole community is rallying around him and supporting him. And uh, that's what we're hoping. We're, want, we're hoping to see the right thing, but also we're hoping that we change this narrative that's going on about veterans and, 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 and the way that we're being scrutinized for the, the kind of things that these politicians are asking us to go do. Okay. You know, that's the problem. Now, now we heard about this. Uh, this uh, plays into this as well. Uh, this uh, Iraqi uh, that was, uh, was uh, had a, uh, I think, a chained child that he was sexually abusing, and special forces went in there and, uh, and uh, kind of thrashed him. I understand. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think wait. it was Afghanistan. It might have been Afghanistan. If we're talking about the Green oh, that, Beret. that's right, yeah. the Afghanistan. Th yeah, so that's right. a big the problem. Dancing, yeah. The dancing, dancing boys of boys Afghanistan. Of it's Afghanistan. a common thing in certain parts of Afghanistan for there to be you know, these dancing boys that dance before tribal elders and then they're raped repeatedly. And um, I believe it was a, a, a Green Beret that stood up and actually um, did something about it. And he's being, uh, you know, he, he's on the hook now for, you know. And, and so th there's this... I don't know, I think we just don't understand war simply. And, and I think partly we feel shame about having to do it as a society, but we ask these men to go do it and we don't know how to register that with our belief system. And so we interject into how they should do it without having any clue what it is or what it's like. And so that's, I think, that feeling is a difficult thing for a lot of veterans. A lot of veterans struggle with that. And I think it makes certain veterans question what they're doing. And mm -hmm. you better believe that plays into the psychological well-being of a lot of, uh, of, of a lot of guys, especially when they're in and also when they get out. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I do, I mean, we, we can't change everything. We can't change the, 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 the problems that guys face from real trauma that they experience. But what we can change is the way people are treating them on the outside. So I'm hoping that's one thing that we can see uh, change. It was, it, was, it was also that and the inability to say what the mission really is. I remember I, yeah. I, went, I went to you know, a, a very high up uh, uh, officer in, the, in, in my community and I, and I was getting out. So I knew I had the freedom to ask him whatever, you know, whatever I wanted at this point in care. And I was getting out. And I said, who are we at war with? I just wanted to know his direct answer. Who are we at war? Because we're at war. Okay, I, I'm, I'm with bated breath. I'm waiting to hear who are we at war with. According, this was a SEAL team commander. Is that's, that that's, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. And even in our own community, at times, there's people that can't answer that question, and he really couldn't. He was saying, "Well, with multiple different people we're at war with, and we don't want to isolate one people over the other people." It was a very, very long-winded, uh, very political um, answer. But that is the underlying problem is if you're in a war that you can't define, you're not gonna win it. And, and that's the perpetual nature of the this war is, on terror and what it's become. This there's is no, Vietnam again. There's no winning this war, and uh, it's a perpetual state of readiness where a lot of people make money, and, um, and, and this, is, this, is, this is a big problem. And, um, so you, this, uh, you know, being in for six years, I am sure that you're like one of the last people that they want to release from active duty after six years. They've got an investment, uh, you know, I, I know it's gotta be millions 
millions yes. that have been invested in you yeah. as as a warrior, and they don't want you just out on the street, just uh, you know, contracting no. uh, to to rescue uh, you know people from pedophile rings. No, they they work hard on you. They try. They they offer you plenty of money, tax free for that for that reenlistment bonus. That's mm-hmm. what they you know they're hoping if they can get you to reenlist to get you to ten years, then you'll stay in, and that's that's really um, the crucial moment. Most guys stay in after they've been in over ten years. So I was at a place where I had to decide, am I going to stay and, in? And you've already had a rude awakening uh, on, on a couple fronts, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. spiritually, and also you're seeing the seedy underbelly of the political environment That's uh, that you're forced to uh, do combat in. That's right. And it really, the hardest thing about leaving was our, was our guys, our community, amazing community, amazing friendships. The guys in our, in our community is definitely not the problem. The, the war fighters, that's not the problem. It's the people that are handcuffing them, giving them illogical missions or missions that are not clearly defined, and then asking them to go fight and die um, or be scrutinized for that fighting. Mm -hmm. Um, That is a perpetual problem, and uh, I believe is destroying the morale and the uh, just the uh, the state of mind of our active duty military right now. So. You decide to make your move. You're gonna go out into the civilian world again. And so, where do you go? What, what's happening now? You've had your awakening <laughs> on a couple of fronts. Yeah. Where I, are we going? I am, I'm now, I get out, and the first thing I do is I go back home to my hometown of Roanoke, Virginia. And um, I start dabbling in a, a business that my father started, uh, insurance sales. I started uh, trying to sell insurance, and I really thought I could make it happen, and I realized really quickly that I could not. And nothing against the trade, nothing against the profession. I just, I needed something else. And uh, again, I was looking for something. Yeah, you you don't seem to be an insurance salesman kind of guy to me. (laughs) Yeah, coerce people into buying insurance in different (laughs) different ways and different techniques. But... um, what really, what really I started doing, you know, I kind of I segued into um, using my skill sets uh, to do good. And so I started with SWAT teams. I realized police around the country needed help and wanted more training. And they, they were, um, you know, this was pretty common for most of the departments I work with. They wanted more effective training. And mm-hmm. so I started working with multiple different police departments and agencies, training their tactical units and using my skill sets to enable our, our law enforcement partners. Um, and just around the country, the people that protect the homeland. That was what was really passionate to me. And Mm -hmm. then I I started to realize how big of a problem that sex slavery, sex trafficking was, and that's what really grabbed me. When I was talking about, like, I was looking for the next war, I thought I had found it in the military. I, I, I I got to see some of it, but what I really wanted was to fight for the right idea. You know what I mean? And this was an idea that transcended all politics, transcended all the geopolitical strategies out there and made things very clear. Are we gonna help these kids or are we not? Okay, and so that, that, that's, the, that's the next war. That's what uh, you're going to be involved in. This is what we opened the entire uh, series with, uh, that war. Uh, but, uh, and I, I wanna also go back as your third year uh, in the, the Navy as a SEAL, and you, but there's already a shift. You were already oh, keeping yeah. kosher, you yeah. know, uh, only eating clean, and, and yeah. so there, there was uh, some Something was going on. Did did this cause any kind of conflict uh, uh, among your comrades? Uh, a lot of jokes. Uh, my guys would make all kinds of jokes. They knew I didn't eat pork or shellfish, and, and they and they actually some of them knew me beforehand. So they're like, "What are you? What are you changing for?" You know, and uh, <laughs> you know, just weird. So guys would give me guys would give me a little bit of you know flack for it, but you know. All in all, my friends were really good to me, and uh, they understood. Yeah. Now, uh, some people say, oh, he's trying to earn his salvation or whatever. Yes. You ever run into oh, that yes. uh, with, uh, yeah. with with fellow believers? Because I, I know Family among too. seals, Family. among the real warriors, a lot of them are believers. They're Christians. That's true. Uh, so, you know, the, some of the greatest warriors of all times have been Christians. And so, yeah. you know, so I, I, I know Friends and family, even. I mean, yeah. there were people that the perception of doing anything that looked, in their minds, Jewish, which they have associated with legalism, um, you know, there's not that differentiation between the laws of the rabbis, the man-made laws and enactments, and the father's laws, which clearly 
um, he wants us to do that should mm-hmm. go without saying uh, that if he said something ever in history, he wants us to keep uh, doing it. And why would he change that? So um, that was a that was a sticking point though, and there was a lot of people. Actually, I remember a lot of resistance. I didn't have much community either. I didn't have a lot of people. I mean, besides you know YouTube videos and my own personal study, it was really my community. So the first thing I did when I was uh, I joined a messianic synagogue. Had a real, you know, made some really great friends in, in a, a traditional Messianic Jewish synagogue, mm-hmm. which um, you know I had started with your teaching, so I had kind of started to delve into the the different things that Yeshua was doing to expose man-made traditions, particularly of the Pharisees at the time, mm-hmm. and I was seeing a lot of these things being brought back out with a combination of Christian beliefs, which a lot of Pharisaic beliefs and <laughs> kind so, of a mixture. I wanted of community. Messianic Judaism. Yeah, uh, I, wanted, kind of I just mixture. wanted the community. I think, and yeah. it was nice to see people that, and there was honestly a lot of really good-hearted, awesome people there as well mm-hmm. that would just love the Torah, and so. I, I, I really look back on it as a fond as a fond time and a really good time of establishing community. But yes, it was definitely. Uh, I, I found myself looking around, going, "I just came in. I just thought I left this, you know." And here is the same. Some of the, some of the the rituals and things were exactly identical in nature to a lot of the same man made things I was doing um, previously in Christianity. So. Um, the whole thing for me that resonated, you know, that I was on, that I was tracking for is only God has the right to make a law. It's that simple. And anyone else in the rest of the world is trying to convince us which other laws we should keep, and mm-hmm. therein lies religion and right, all right. the different perceptions. And play. it's all about corralling people to a certain point of view, and there's the, and then usually monetizing it somehow, right? But it's all about how do you lead people by the nose? And nope, that's the, you know you can't just do what God wants. You also have to do this, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's really the thing that I became very attuned to, to listening to. And I, I can't say that, that anyone had a, a greater impact than your teachings on that. Well, that is uh, really the the foundation of all the commandments in the Torah is thou shalt not add unto the commandments I give you, thou shalt not diminish thereof, that you may keep all the commandments of Yehovah your Elohim. Once we add to or subtract from, we no longer have the commandments of God. We have man-made religion. And this is what Yeshua is vehemently opposed to, dramatically, with every miracle that he does, he is violating established rules of rabbinic Judaism back in the first century. And most people don't even understand that. So, you know, th- thank you for, uh, for continuing the fight on this. Now, we've got a lot more to, to cover. I want you to come back. Come back I'd next week to. because, you know, we, we really need to, we need to ferret some of these truths out because a lot of people are finding themselves on this path. They have they become disillusioned with the Christianity or as I say, the churchianity of their youth and they're starting, by the time they hit 50 years old, they're starting to ask the questions. Wait, this doesn't honestly make sense. You know, there are things that, you know, you know, I come down to the second grade uh, question. Pastor, how do you get three days and three nights between Good Friday and Easter Sunday? Einstein couldn't get three days and three nights in that, right. and yet this is the one and only sign of Yeshua's authenticity. See, you know, we, we've got to get back, and, and we're going to explore these things together. Because I'm you to started it. exploring this in Baghdad, on the battlefield, and both of us have met on common ground. That common ground was really Derek Prince's teaching uh, to awaken uh, the, 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 the prophetic, uh, the direction of Israel and what is going to happen in the last days. Because I believe that we're called to be warriors now. As Timothy was told by Paul, war a good warfare, you are ordained as a warrior. Now I wanna see commendation, I wanna see medals pinned on your chest. And that's what it's all about. We are to be warriors in this day and time. We are to establish uh, righteousness and justice upon the earth because there are some things that have been laid into our hands. I want you back with us to explore some of these things of truth, justice, and righteousness because we're gonna appeal to the almighty judge for him to render his verdict so that the righteous are liberated. Amen. And the oppressors we'll be back. are destroyed. I cannot Amen. wait, Michael. Thank okay. you so much for having me. I'm going to close in prayer. Yivarechacha Yehovah Yahovah Yahir Yehovah Panavilecha Vichunaka. 
יישא יעלבל פניו אליך, ויישם לך שלום, בשם ישוע, המשיח, שר שלום. יעלבל bless you and keep you. יעלבל lift his face upon you and be gracious unto you. יעלבל lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen, amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Okay. Shavuot Tov, have a good week. We'll see you right back here for the rest of the story with Dave Lopez, Shabbat Night Live. Lehi Throat, bye-bye.